good afternoon again. Um, and Eve, I have to say, that's a little scary. Uh, not the Donald Trump portion, but, but uh, what you're doing with uh, collecting data. And I think it's a, uh, a lesson for all the genealogists who casually take their information and throw it out and say, it's only another genealogist who's going to see it. And I'm not complaining, I'm just commenting uh, on that. So uh, I've been a genealogist since I was a boy. That takes me back to when Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States. In fact, um, when my grandmother died two months before my bar mitzvah in 1965, everyone came over to the house to pay their condolences uh, to my uh, mother and her sister. And I was the, actually a little kid running around to the relatives saying, well, now that you're over at the house, why don't you tell me about your family? Tell me about the old country. And it wasn't the good old country. In fact, that's when I learned that the old country was indeed, for most of us, not the good old country. That's why we left. In fact, let me introduce you to that genealogist. Um, no one laughed. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you're taking the picture seriously, because when I showed it a couple of weeks ago in Washington, DC, it got my biggest applause line. <laughs> Uh, this is actually the genealogy that I drew uh, in uh, 19, uh, well, 65 or 66. It shows the collection of the, uh, of the relatives. Uh, one of the relatives uh, took control of the family tree and put down uh, her relatives uh, or his relatives uh, for me. You can see somebody said, well, they, they were born in 1857. They died in 19. Let me just write it here on your genealogy, Bennett. And so that's indeed what they did. Uh, now, uh, all of you should know that the first study using the Y chromosome was, was Carl Skorecki's, along with uh, some folks with, uh, from University College London and Dr. Michael Hammer from the University of Arizona. And I too was electrified by that. I wrote to the University of Arizona at that time and said, I'm not a Kohen, but I'm happy to do a DNA test. And of course, my email went, went unanswered. What I was trying to do in 1999, uh, after I had sold my company to a publicly traded firm and had, in the words of my wife, way too much time on your hands, uh, and she threw me out of the kitchen for suggesting that I should reorganize her cupboard for her. Uh, she told me I should pick up golf and go back to genealogy. In fact, I went back to genealogy, and I had this, uh, this uh, uh, genealogy tree that I did on one of my lines on my NITS line, they came from the southern Ukraine, and then I entered in a website called Jewish Gen using their family finder. Uh, I found someone named Maria de Los Angeles, Maria of the Angels NITS, living in Buenos Aires, who said that her great-grandfather came from the same village in the Ukraine that my grandmother was born in. And so when I looked at the names in their family tree, we had names in common, we had a village in common, but we didn't have a piece, piece of paper. We didn't have what genealogists consider sacrosanct, which is when I happened to remember that there had been this study on the Kohanim and another on the Jefferson family, and they both had used the male inherited Y chromosome. So traditional Y and mtDNA looks at the direct line of the father, where the Y chromosome is passed down, and then the direct line of the mother, where the mitochondria was passed down, but no one in the center could play because you know, there was no such thing as autosomal DNA testing at that time, which is why I had to beg a cousin of mine in California to do a DNA test for, well, what he felt was my benefit, what I felt was for our benefit. Uh, in fact, he told me no. He told me he was a sheriff in Culver City. He knew what could be done with DNA. If he only knew today what could be done with DNA. Um, uh, and, he, and he refused. Fortunately, when I called him again to beg him, his wife got on the phone and she said, this sounds like a wonderful idea, at which point I said, if only your husband felt the same way. Uh, she said, send that DNA kid over here. I guarantee he'll do it. I don't know what she threatened him with, but, but it certainly it was a kid that came back very, very quickly. So. The Y chromosome results can point in the direction uh, that you, well, it can point the direction to your ancestral migratory path along the direct uh, male line. 
Mitochondria testing, when you use the entire mitochondria molecule, can do the exact same thing on the direct paternal line. And those tests are very, very, very clear for genealogists. They're clear, they're unambiguous. Why? Because the Y chromosome line comes from your dad. If you match anybody on that line, you know how you're related. Same thing on the mitochondria. Uh, autosomal DNA, uh, unfortunately, does not work that way. It casts a very wonderfully broad, relatively shallow net. And so what you'll know is that you're, you have matching chunks or matching blocks of DNA with someone, but you won't know how you're related. And this is a conundrum that all genealogists who are now becoming genetic genealogists have to deal with. So let me sum up this by saying that genetic genealogy is what I believe is guilt by association. People with matching DNA means they have a shared heritage with you. Even if you don't know what your heritage is, recent ancestry we call genealogy. That deeper ancestry, of course, is called uh, anthropology. And because I did a little lecture a little bit earlier, I have absolutely decapitated my many samples. I think I have one example. This is the story of the God, uh, I'm sorry, of the Goodlove family from Iowa. They have their family Bible that goes back to 1783. He had these unexplicable names, Ashkenazim, on his matches. And this fellow is an Iowa farmer, kind of the salt of the earth. Uh, you say something to him, he doesn't come back to you quick, kind of thinks about it. And we had a kind of a halting 15 minute conversation with not a lot of words. Uh, just, just uh, you can hear the, the tractor wheels grinding, so to speak. So he, he got these results back and he has a uh, Kohanim match, which he means he, his profile matched the studies that had been done on the Kohanim. Um, and he has, uh, it says Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, Kohen, Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi even matches a Sephardic guy down here. And uh, he called me back three days later and said, look, I'd like to start one of these surname projects. I said, okay. He said, because I know what our name was in Germany. And I said, well, sir, what was your name in Germany? He said, well, I'm sure we came, before we became good loves and God loves, we were Gottliebs. <laughs> and ultimately, he reached out in America looking for men named Gottlieb, tested, and found a fellow who was a Gottlieb that had a very, very similar uh, Y chromosome signature to him. So on mtDNA, um, the results kind of look like this. You're compared against a reference sequence. And ultimately, we tell you what your differences from the reference sequence are. Of course, it wouldn't be real genetic genealogy if we didn't tell you the countries where your matches came from and the names of the people that you match. And for me, the real surprise was this one up here, where it says that this fellow, who also matches me on the complete, uh, on the complete uh, mitochondria molecule, he is from Morocco. So again, I have this non-Ashkenazi thing going on, which again, I could never have determined, you know, just by looking in a mirror. Uh, in 2010, uh, 23andMe introduced a product uh, that was genealogical, non-medical, that used about 700,000 SNPs, and they used it in such a way that you could, uh, in effect, show people who have matching blocks of DNA in common with you. Our product we call Family Finder, and it really is, or it really has become the next gener the next uh, revolution in genetic genealogy. So this is in effect what you could do in 2010 with the direct male line and the direct female line, but none of these people, as I said earlier, could play the game. However, in 2010, that all changed. Now you can cast a very broad net, looking not only for aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, half cousins, but you can look at first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, and if you're lucky, fourth cousins, the only problem for us Ashkenazim, or us Jews, shall I say, is that because we have practiced endogamy so effectively that uh, we have lots and lots of matches. For example, I have 7,000 matches, even though our database is probably only three or 
Jewish, whereas we have lots more Scottish people and Irish people in our database, and those guys have maybe a thousand people or 1,500 people on their match list. And that's because truly we are not uh, the products of 32 great, great, great grandparents as we heard last night. Maybe 31, maybe 29, maybe 27. Um, and for that reason, um, many, many, many people in this room are cousins, maybe all of us are cousins, without realizing that fact. So what's special about using autosomal DNA? Well, you can find relatives across all lines. You can determine the degree of relationship. If you wanna ask the question and see if you have any half-siblings, uh, you can ask that question, although in our business, we say if you don't really wanna know the answer to the question, don't ask the question. Uh, you can make contacts with your matches. It's a perfect test for adoptees, and that's because in unlike the Y and the MT, which are gender specific, using autosomal DNA, it's, it's using a test that's gender agnostic. Uh, recently, uh, uh, we launched, in fact, last week, we launched a, uh, a new feature that allows you to start breaking up those massive lists of matches you have into buckets. Uh, for example, you'd have a parental bucket, a father's bucket, a mother's bucket, and people uh, bucket that they were related to from both your mother's side and your father's side. And it's amazing uh, for me, for example, it's amazing how many people on the list show that I'm related on both sides. Uh, this would be an example of a paternal bucket. It got all of my uh, relatives right. I'm glad to say it also got all of my relatives right on my mom's side. So I think we're kind of on to something uh, with that because it's a conundrum if you're a genealogist. Not if you're related anymore, but how you are related. Uh, it starts with a tree. Uh, what you do is you, in effect, link people on your tree, one to the other. So I would be linked to my mother. I would be linked to my I would be linked up to both my mother and my father, so as it says here, you'll uh, link your relatives. This is the little symbol that tells you that we found someone like, similar to what Jeannie does, where we think we found someone who has a name uh, similar to that that's on uh, your tree, and then you can go in and you can either link them or you can say no, it just happens to be the same last name. And once you've done that, then automatically the program will split some of your, about two-thirds of your relatives out into your father's side, your mother's side, or both sides. Uh, it also offers a percentage test, as all the autosomal tests do. Uh, sometime in the month of July, we will be introducing or reintroducing uh, this product with a, uh, with a Sephardic underlying database. It will be the first of the Sephardic uh, first of it, the, it, well, that would be the first introduction of a Sephardic database among all the companies who are offering this. We do a lot of business with, um, you know, with the Hispanic community, and it, I, I can tell you it's one of the most common questions we get from the uh, Hispanic community, do I have Jewish ancestry? And if it's not that question, it's why you show me having Jewish ancestry? All it takes is a swab. I showed you this earlier, but what I didn't show you was a was a cartoon from the uh, that, well, that someone drew for us. He said, "What's the best story that you've got about DNA testing?" And, and Max and I said, "It's very easy. It's the doctor who scraped the outside of his cheek instead of the inside of his cheek." And the fellow said, "I have no more questions for you. I know exactly what I'm going to draw." And so, in the next slide, you'll see a picture of the doctor. And he's, uh, he's on the phone, he's calling us, uh, his family <coughs> DNA box is there, and he says, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. This is the right way to swab, but not this way. And so you can see he's having a little bit of difficulty with his cheek scraper. And uh, uh, so for those of you in the back who can't see, uh, he has his cheek scraper, and he's truly trying to do a cheek scrape, but again, he didn't read the instructions. So, you know, as they say, when all else fails, read the book. And as a genealogist, this is the question that is burning for me. I've always wanted to know, am I related to Alan Greenspan, or is he related to me? And I was at a conference when both of us were, were there, and, and when he met me, he said, oh, maybe we're related. And I happened to have a DNA kit with me. <laughs> because 
I had been stalking him. And, uh, and when he got up to leave, uh, you know, my wife said, you better go get it now. So I went there and I said, Dr. Greenspan, you know, let's, let's do a DNA test. And he said, well, what does it matter? And I really didn't know, you know what to say. So I said, well, you might find that you're related to me. And that kind of went over, shall we say, like a pork chop at a bar mitzvah. So, so I ended up not getting his DNA test, although I'm happy to say that after 15 years and dozens and dozens of free DNA tests that I've given away, I have found my Greenspan ancestors. They're living in Scotland with the name of Green with an E, and they're living in Manhattan with the name Green without an E. And so I was just lucky to be at the right place at the right time and, uh, and was able to talk someone into doing a DNA test and lo and behold, I found my relative. But from a genetic genealogy standpoint, I would say that, that the community has spent 15 years creating a genetic survey. And what we need to do is we need to move towards a time of a genetic census because um, more data is probably better data. And so this is really a, a partnership. I know that, uh, uh, you know that the academic community likely feels the same way. Certainly, uh, Yanni feels the same way because there's you know more data would be better data. Uh, we also feel the same way. And so with that, I thank you very much. And uh, <laughs>